Welcome to the NBA Coast to Coast Podcast, brought to you by thelines.com. Coming to you from the West Coast, Josh Lander, joined by Nate Weitzer. He's on the East Coast, and we are rolling along in the NBA postseason. Friday, got two more games that we're looking at here. The Knicks take their 2-0 lead into Indiana. Also got the Timberwolves and the Nuggets. Timbies up 2-0 at home. Chance to go up 3-0 and maybe put away the champs. But we'll be taking a look at best bets in this one. Also got player props up in a separate episode as we're bringing you both of these videos each and every day now throughout this postseason. Also want you to head to the lines.com. Use everything that we have up there. A lot of stuff uh, that we're looking at here with some series prices still and futures odds and plenty of stuff to help you within each series as well right now for these conference semifinals. So, Nate, let's go ahead and get into your first NBA best bet. Just want to tell people we are recording this here on Thursday night. Getting ahead of this stuff, some early lines and good value hopefully here in these best bets. Yeah, I, I know the Pacers to bounce back here in the first half is a popular one. That spread has been rising for the half. I'm going to specifically target the second quarter, minus two. I actually got it at, I mean, m- maybe minus two and a half by the time you get this here. But the second quarter is where this team separates, right? This team that that uses its bench more than anyone else in the playoffs and now facing a Knicks team that has like four and a half players at this point. Like OG ruled out. Brunson is legit questionable. Uh, if he goes, he he does get a couple minutes rest in the second quarter. Like th- that is why you target this. That's that's when the starters might get a little bit of bur- I mean, a little bit of a blow. The most the most likely in the entire game, right? Second quarter is you need a little bit of second unit run here. And the Pacers bench happens to be better than their starters in the middle of the game. At least TJ and Obi Toppin have been right now. Because in, in part because it looks so good because they're going against absolutely gas starters who've been playing 46 to 48 minutes a game. Uh, and we talk about why why TJ needed to be playing more. And then Rick Carlisle, you know, the most obvious mistake that he made down the stretch was just not putting him back in the game. But uh, when TJ's out there, like the Pacers take on even more of that identity of just like we're going to push at every opportunity. We're going to speed the game up. We're going to be all up in your grill. And at home, that that is even more the case that they all season were able to kind of speed the game up and and, and play their style at home. In, in the second quarter against Milwaukee, they won at the won their last two at home, thirty to twenty seven, were the totals there. I mean, one twenty eight offensive rating, one twenty defensive rating makes me think about the over along with the Pacers parlay for this quarter, which is plus two twenty. The thing is, like, I got to know what's up with Brunson. Like, if he if he can't go, I don't think you can trust the Knicks to score. Although they actually scored more in the second quarter of game two when he was out. The entire – and then he, they only had 22 in game one with Brunson missing a couple minutes there. I mean, he had eight points in that one. He only had six points in game six at Philly. Huge game, as we know. And they lost that second quarter by 17 points. So – This is what I'm saying, like with the Knicks wearing down, this is the best way to attack them. They have this magic to come back late no matter what, it seems like. That might only be the case at MSG. I don't know. I, I, at this point, you know, lack confidence in Rick Carlisle to to take his team to win down the stretch, although I do think they they have a shot here. But in the second quarter, the the Pacers have just been absolutely fabulous this series. 10 to 1 assist to turnover ratio, 60-60 splits. That's a 148 offensive rating. It just backs up everything I'm saying about the situation. Yeah, no, no, no arguments for me here. I mean, it's tough for me to uh, to see the Knicks being able to overcome not just you know being on the on the road as the the the, the up two zero right this classic like well the, the against the spread stuff in like the first quarter and first half or the team down two zero coming back home all that stuff is going to work against them. Plus, I mean, we're going to be seeing some, I mean, I hate to say, we're going to be seeing some Alec Burks. We're going to be seeing some Jericho Sims. Um, I don't know how early they're going to get in. I could see like Tibbs putting Alec Burks in for four minutes, two turnovers and a made three, and he doesn't sit, he doesn't play again. Jericho Sims, maybe a minute. I mean, look, there's just not enough guys. Like you got to, you just ran all these dudes into the ground. Now you're going to do what? We're going to play with Miles McBride for for 40 minutes. Like it's going to be tough. So um not great, not looking great, and uh, I think uh, at least you know where whichever quarter you want to take. I think the first half, I think the the first quarter, I think it all is probably good for for the Pacers right now. Um, maybe, maybe you don't feel as comfortable with the whole game because of the of the the Knicks' ability to slow things down. But I think at home, the Pacers' uh, desire to just like beat the crap out of them is going to be in there. So um, let me stay in this game real quick with uh, an interesting one of our. I, I think I think we both feel equally 
passionate about head-to-head bets. Very fun stuff on DraftKings. Um, so I'm taking a head-to-head bet here for Halliburton to have more threes than um, than Jalen Brunson. So if they push, you get Brunson gets it because it's plus 0.5 for Halliburton. So he has to win by one. Um, and there's not going to be a push, which is great. But he uh, the, the plus 105 on DraftKings. It's it's a really nice uh, number there for for ha- for Hallie to go over uh, that more than than Brunson. Really, like really the the like you know prototypical way this would work is Hallie gets three, Brunson gets two. Honestly, because I mean, ha- for me, like I was looking at fading Jalen Brunson. I tried in the last game, and honestly, like the only thing that scares you about the bet for Brunson and like going under again for him on two and a half threes, which I'm not doing. I'm just taking Halliburton to get more than him. Um, is the fact that like if he can't go as uh, to the rim as easily, if he can't do all his quick cuts because his freaking foot hurts that bad, and it's then then he's you know, it's not the same player, right? Like he definitely relies upon a, a lot of pivots and uh, and quick you know just quick cuts essentially, and if he can't do that, as you know, you, every, anybody who's ever even played pickup knows, like if you're like ah oh, crap, I can't do much right now because my legs, then you're just gonna start shooting, and that would be the worry is that he takes a few more threes. But I mean, last game I pegged him for taking four threes, and I didn't think he was going to hit three of five, four rather. That's the amount. And he took a few more when he came back, but like I had him for about four threes. He made three of six. Either way, main point being like, I, I can't see six continuing to be the number. It's been a five or fewer in the majority of the games that they played against the Pacers this season, who, as we all know, are an incredible three point defense. He's two for 5.8 on the season and in, in, including the playoffs rather in five games versus this team taking, like I said, about 5.8. He's made one in three of these games. Uh, he's made four and three in the other two. Uh, I, I would still contend that, like, if he didn't get hurt last game and didn't feel the need to just pull up uh, a lot, then he he would have still gone under this number in the in the last game. And also, the free throws are still there for him if he wants them. I think even with the injured foot, so uh, he'll still be looking for those on the season. He averaged two point seven. He took about six point eight. Um, but like I said, this is the best three point defense in the league because that's what they prioritize. Brunt, uh, for Halley on the season, two point nine, taking seven point eight. A bit more against the Knicks, though, and and really like it's for me. Yeah, you can look at it. He's gotten two plus in every game, so. I I think he's good to get the two plus in this game. And if he gets, you know, three, I think he's in a really good position to at least beat Brun- uh, Brunson on the threes battle here. Uh, but also like the, the concept of him shooting was a huge, you know, talking point going from game one to game two. And he listened. And I, I, I would still argue that they had a better shot of winning game two, not necessarily a better shot, but I think they were in, in control for a bit. And obviously at halftime, they were in, in big control and everything was looking like, Oh my God, this is a series turner. Uh, and they really just let it slip away. And I would still argue that TJ, McConnell should be playing more than three minutes in the fourth quarter. That's for another conversation though. Um, and I think it would have helped, but just as important is that like he, his success definitely was something that I think would be seen as a positive and, and a necessary thing for him moving forward to take more than the six shots he took in game one. I mean, 19 field goal attempts. It's not that much for him in, in, considering how many he's taken during the season as well. Uh, and I think if he stays at around 16 to 19, Give him the like seven threes that he would take in there. It's all it's all threes and and layups for him when he can get it in transition. So uh, he should be taking way more attempts, at least I, like three more attempts, which should give him a good shot at getting one more three made. Yeah, these odds are fantastic considering the standalone odds, right? I mean, Brunson is plus money to go under. Halliburton is minus one seventy five to go over. They're they're both at two and a half. So I like if you can get this head to head comparison, that's that's fantastic. Uh, well, I mean, what's your what's your take for it, someone who doesn't have a DK account, though, and like which of these props you're looking at or anything with Halliburton? Yeah, I think for for Halley, you really you go with the, the like you, you juice it up or ladder it at that point. Like I would rather just take like a small wager on him to, to make four threes in this game. If you think he's going to take eight to nine, like I'm saying, he took 11 last game. I think eight to nine is a fair uh, projection for his threes. So not that unrealistic that he would hit 50 percent. The thing that would scare you about it, too, I just just pointed out that so it's known is that like on the season, he made point nine, basically one more three uh, on the road than he did at home. In part, you might think that like he's more likely to assist, but his assists don't go up that much. His potential assists don't really go up home versus road. So I think for me, if you're playing the three point bet without the ability to play head to head, you just sprinkle a little bit on the four plus. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I think I like the assist, though, though, just based on the situation that he finally showed himself to be a threat on offense. And now that's going to open up his game and that the Pacers are going to be running and gunning at home. Um, the points and assists and, and that the Knicks did such a poor job running him off the line in game two. Like they, they can't, they just let him set up and, and fire and like get, get his rhythm going and they got to do a better job with that. But like, like we've been saying, they don't really have the bodies to do so. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's a second pick, just more, you know, pace is, is over for the game here. Two twenty two. 
if the Pacers are controlling this, I mean, you can go Pacers money line and the over because that's the way they win here. Uh, pretty much every game in the playoffs that they've won ha- has flown over this total. Both of these losses in games in the first two games flew over. Um, and now Rick Carlisle is has submitted a tape with 78 calls that he's complaining about. I mean, just like this this whining from him and Mike Malone in in the games where they just like ha- handed in like a terrible an F minus game plan and then just like want to take it out on the referees down the stretch and it's like oh man you you look so so even worse it's just not a good look um but i mean yeah in this game the pacers should bounce back as we're saying the trends um they they should have a lot more success on offense with no OG and Nobi I mean, Siakam is gonna is gonna probably cook, get going against Precious Achua, who's just not quick enough for him. I mean, he, he got on a big in that Milwaukee series, and that that was really great for him in the first two there. Um, I'm also thinking about the fourth quarter over because, like, if 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 only if Brunson is playing and seems like he's gonna be a full go here, because fourth quarter craziness has just followed this Knicks team uh, mostly at home, but even in their last five, including some in Philly there. I mean, the, the fourth quarters have averaged 58. Um, we're, they we're talking about a total of 53 and a half for the fourth. Brunson is shooting 55% in this series, scoring 17 and a half in the fourth quarter. Again, because Rick Carlisle doesn't understand how to potentially slow him down. So maybe TJ closes in this one. And then like, like I've been saying, like he's just a human uh, increase of, 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 of the pace. Like he's just like puts a stamp on the team to be like, Look, we're running. Um, I mean, and he has a one forty five offensive rating his last three home playoff games, so he's he's gonna be helping that offense for sure. If Brunson is at, at all diminished, this is sort of like Josh Hart's like MO, right? He's like, All right, let me just show everybody that I can run up and down the floor for forty eight minutes. Again, the Aryan Robin of the NBA who is more fit than everybody else out there. And uh he's gonna try to push the pace, which helps you with the over. He I mean, he's partially responsible for both those games going over uh, almost to the Knicks detriment there in game one. But like, I, I mean, in, and then you got Deuce McBride in there for, you know, the, the Knicks are, might look a little bit different here is my point um, with the shorter bench, but it's more about the Pacers who, you know, they only shot two of seven from the free throw line in, in, in the fourth quarter at MSG in that one, that, that one still got to 61 in the fourth quarter. At home on the season, fourth best offensive rating, fifth fastest pace in the fourth. And like I was saying with Halliburton, like he found his offense finally. It was like a threat uh, with 10 points and two assists in that fourth quarter. He had three points in the previous four fourth quarters in the playoffs, averaging 0.7 points per fourth quarter. Like, yeah, we're going to need a little something from you down the stretch to make sure this one uh, stays high scoring. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I mean, that's the thing about the playoffs. Like if you go into the fourth quarter of this game and the Knicks are within five points, right? I mean, shit, within 10 points, honestly, because Brunson is the type of dude that you want (laughs) to close your game. Like Halliburton, great player, future all-star, all of that, current all-star, whatever, Uh, all NBA teams and, and, and everything. Totally agree with that. Would love him as a point guard on my team as well, except for my team already has a point guard that I would rather have in the fourth quarter, which is the main point that I'm making is that like when it comes to just, I need to get a bucket, that's that's what the, the fourth quarter is there for. So uh, I, either way, that's more about the like, you know, the Knicks being in striking distance to win. I don't think either of us said that we like the Pacers at minus nine for or anything. So like if anything, it would be you would still predict a closer game. And I think this all is still pretty relevant. Like you need this game to be somewhat close because if if the Knicks get blown out of the water, then like maybe Tibbs never gives up. So, you know, I haven't seen him like bench anybody or like really get those garbage guys time. But either way, like you, you need the Knicks to come along to, to get to the to the easy over anyway because like 120 to 95 is not this like out of control scenario where it's just like well we couldn't do anything Brunson didn't have it which means we didn't have it as a team and there's nobody to bail us out of this short of Dante DiVincenzo hitting like six or seven threes so I think the Knicks being close in this game and and the the totals going over in the fourth quarter is pretty pretty relevant here so we'll see how that goes and I I think that should be the case for that to unfold that way but I'm going to go with a bet that um you know what I I just I kind of want to be contrarian more than anything because like I'm assuming that the the uh, consistent narrative for a lot of people, especially those who want to believe in the Nuggets, is that they're going to come out firing in the first quarter. Um, I, I don't think you're going to see 
that scenario play out with Denver. Like, I don't know what would wake them up differently than what's happened. I mean, maybe some Michael Porter Jr. threes, but I'm going to take the, the Timberwolves to just keep winning the first quarter. Um, minus one and a half, minus 108 on DraftKings. Uh, I mean, look, what we're going to see, I, I think, and you'll talk about this in player props probably, is Jokic come out and just keep trying to score. But like I don't love that as your as your game plan because if if Jokic is putting in like ten points in the first quarter and nobody else is really doing much, um, and it, there's no easy threes created for Michael Porter Jr. because Joker's busy scoring right and stuff, and they're not going to double off of 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 their guys when they have Rudy Gobert there, then I I still think that's the same game plan playing into the hands of the Timberwolves, uh, and they're like if I, if, if I I'm going you we talk about going with your gut a little bit, and my thing with Ant Edwards is like. Please count him out. Please assume that he's supposed to be the dude that or that, that his team is going to be down after a certain point in the game or whatever. And I'm still going to go with him to just step on their neck, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, now, Denver's been terrible in first quarters. And I, I still think there's a little bit of like, uh, throw some of the stuff out the window. Like against the Lakers, they were down in the first quarter because of the fact that like it's the Lakers. And that was their that was their hope is that they were just going to like really keep the, the lead this time in this game. But now we're talking about Minnesota, who like during the regular season, Denver was better in the first quarter than Minnesota. They're, I can't like to you know, take that as a feather in the cap of Minnesota, this bet hitting bit basically, but um, they were dominating for the majority of the first quarter in the first game. And then they completely just blew them out by the first quarter of game two. Uh, they were winning for 11 minutes and 50 seconds of the first quarter in game one, and then sort of slowly gave it away because Joker did chip away at them, but he still missed a good amount of shots there in the first quarter. Uh, and, and it really took, uh, some other, like I said, some a couple of like bombs from Michael Porter Jr., one of them, which was like 32 feet away for them to to come back in that first quarter and, and take the lead by two at the end of that one. So I just think it's going to be a lot of like the same sort of slow start for this Denver team that I don't know how they're pulling themselves out of the malaise. They're all their starters are in the negative for the first quarter in the playoffs right now. I mean, it's really nasty stuff. Joker's minus 3.9 overall. Gordon minus seven, Murray minus 6.3, KCP minus 4.9. Uh, MPJ is the only one with like a minus 3.1 because he stayed in there with some of the, the, the backups who did all right for them in the uh, in game two there uh, to like manage in the last couple minutes to be like a little bit better. But um, there's just not much that you would feel comfortable with with Denver. And I think Minnesota is going to be freaking maniacal inside of that building uh, as loud as you're ever going to hear it. So it's it's going to be really, really tough for the, the Nuggets to squeak out a win in the first quarter specifically. This is a really tough game to cap in, in general. I mean, because because of the situation, the Nuggets have not faced adversity at all in two years in the playoffs. Now we have three days off, which I can't understand how that that's going to happen for any other series. It's just like almost a complete new series. They had all this time to regroup after just getting their asses whooped and it's just like how much is that gonna boost minnesota's confidence and are they going to like you say step on their neck and follow through here or i mean is denver gonna make the proper adjustments and show that they're still like the, the heart of a champion and all that like there there are a lot of ways this could go i i mean there's a reason we're we're trying to cap the other game more um i i i can't say i know i mean i just know that minnesota that defensive performance in game two was was the best i've seen in the modern nba like for an entire half and so i, I can't have much confidence in the denver offense to overcome that i mean I think my look for this game would be some unders uh, in the sense that like not not the game under a 204, but you can actually get even money for neither team to get 107 at DraftKings minus 105 and maybe even ladder that down to like neither team gets over 104 because I don't think this Minnesota offense like they were shooting way above their head in game two like they're not going to make every three they're not they're not just going to continue to like rain down like they're not a great offensive team but their defense my lord, like I, it's hard to trust Denver to to win this game by by scoring like one ten plus. No way. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, like every part of me is just like this. Not like this. Not like this, Denver. Right? But like, yeah, like you're saying, I, when are why can't they keep doing that for Minnesota? Like, defense isn't something you got to rely on luck or variance. You just play it really hard, man, and they're gonna keep doing that. So uh, that is all the time we have for you. Best bets, though. Also got player props up in a separate episode as we're bringing you each and every day now throughout this postseason. So until we see you next, happy betting. Stop.